promised them. And uh, as they do so, they sort of park it over uh, by Mount Sinai is what happens. And at Mount Sinai, a very significant event takes place that we're going to leapfrog over today, which is the giving of the commandments, the Ten Commandments. You know those ones. They're sort of important. Um, And just uh, one little thing that I like to say about the commandments uh, to just bring a corrective is that oftentimes people... uh, attribute this notion of love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself to Jesus as though he was the one who said it. He did say it, but he was quoting the Torah when he said it. It's not his. He was quoting the Torah, and I actually think Jesus would be like, no, that's not mine. (laughs) Um, But that being said, the reason that's important is that whole piece that we embrace as Christians is really a summation of the Ten Commandments. So it's a very significant moment. Um, But then God, so uh, what happens is they are in the wilderness led by Moses. Moses is their leader guiding them, and if you look at a map, it's He's not leading them well. (laughs) It's quite circuitous. Uh, But regardless, he actually is leading them very, very well, which we'll see in our story today. But part of this parking at Mount Sinai is Moses going back and forth up to the mountain to hear from God, bringing the message down to the people, then back up to the mountain, bringing the message. In our story today, Moses has traversed back up Mount Sinai to hear from God, and that leads us to our scripture reading, which I need to apologize about. I believe Mary is our reader, um, is a bit lengthy. So buckle into our sort of lengthy reading today. I couldn't figure out a way to um, shorten it without compromising the narrative. The reading today is from Exodus 32, 1 through 14. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain... The people gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come make gods for us who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what's become of him. Aaron said to them, Take off the gold rings that are on the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took these from them, formed them into a mold, and cast an image of a calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a festival to the Lord. They rose early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought sacrifices of well-being, and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to revel. The Lord said to Moses, Go down at once. Your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have acted perversely. They have been quick to turn aside from the way that I commanded them. They have cast for themselves an image of a calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. A clear quote. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people. How stiff-necked they are. Now let me alone so that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them. And of you I will make a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the faith of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath, change your mind, and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, how you swore to them by your own self, saying to them, I will multiply your descendants like the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have promised I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he planned to bring on his people. The word of of God for the people of God. All right. Thank you, Mary. That 
was a fantastic reading, was it not? I appreciate that reading and uh, especially getting to, um, well, the, the, the mood that God is in. Hence the sermon title today, God Needs the Breathing Ball. <laughs> I think, I think that's the case here. Um, but in God's defense, do you realize what the people have done in this text? Just a minute ago, I was telling you about the importance of this little thing called the Ten Commandments. What they have done in fashioning a god or gods out of gold is in one fell swoop, they have violated the first and the second commandments. They've just gotten these commandments. They've, they're wondering where Moses is, which I think is a fair question. They're like, well, did you hear the tone in there? I kind of love it. It's sort of like, who is this guy? Like, what are we doing? What are we even doing out here? And now he's been up on the mountain for who knows how long. So they're questioning his leadership. They're very unsure. And they end up violating the first and second commandments. But also, in the people's defense... This is kind of a just normal human thing. If you, what you have to remember is that the people of Israel were in slavery for hundreds of years. That's generation after generation after generation. It is all they know is having, while I don't endorse slavery by any stretch of the imagination, but what it means is their world is fixed and confined and, and controlled. They know what to expect every day, right? It's not good, but it's structured. Now they are out in the wilderness with this one guy leading them who's been up on a mountain for who knows how long. And so it's very natural for human groups of people in a, in a case like that to sort of revert back to old ways, which is what they're doing here. This is a major shift for them that God has brought, which is moving from a, a culture of people who are, when it comes to God, is uh, they're defined by a very polytheistic way of being. This is how the ancient people operated. Um, in fact, God, and, and in a sense theology, is sort of the only answer to what we now identify as science that they could have, right? Which is, which is why they had a sun god and a rain god and a, you know, a, a, a moon god and all these different entities in the world that we now can understand scientifically, they would apply to different gods. When they get the Ten Commandments, that first commandment is, you shall have no other gods before me, God says. So they're shifting from this very polytheistic way of operating into a monotheistic way of operating. But in so doing, they're out in the wilderness, things are confusing, their leaders up on a mountain, and so they're, they're just going back to what they know. Have you ever been in that case? where you're trying to do something new, where you're trying to innovate, where let's just say you're a small church community that once was thriving and the pews were full and they no longer are, and you're realizing that your world is not what it once was 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years ago, and you're realizing that in order to be relevant in your culture and in your world, you're going to have to adapt and change dramatically because the world has changed dramatically. And so you go and try to do some innovative efforts to be relevant in the world, but as you're doing so, you're kind of wondering what's happening and things are confusing and they're very destabilizing and it becomes very natural to just settle back in to what you know. That's what's happening with the people of Israel here. So in their defense, um, they are just reverting back to what they know. It's not necessarily a good thing. They should press forward. We would hope that they would have more faith and not revert back to what they know and go against the very thing that God is calling them to do and be. But nevertheless, they do, and we can understand it, I think, if we've ever been in any kind of situation like that, regardless of the scale. And so that's what they're doing. They're reverting back. Now, the other place that we can very quickly bring some blame is upon Aaron, who seems to very quickly just be like, all right, yeah, let's make, some, let's make a golden calf. 
Which, it's also strange that he's like, okay, you want, us, you want me to make a god, just give me all your gold. <laughs> right? And they're like, sure! Um, I guess the gold isn't really doing them any good in the wilderness anyways. Um, but, but if you read the text a little more closely, and the Hebrew would be more helpful here, the words that are used about this crowd are, they paint more of a picture of a very angry mob. And so Aaron is Moses' kind of right-hand man. He's probably wondering where in the world Moses is as well. He's going, I just got to calm these people down. So I'm going to make a calf if that's, you know what, if that's going to calm them down, I'm going to make the golden calf. So there's lots of blame to go around in this story. But if you really start to humanize it, there's also a way in which we can understand the decisions people are making all around. But nevertheless, God is furious. You could hear it in the reading. God is angry. One of the things that's interesting there is God says to to Moses, he refers to the people as your people whom you brought out of Egypt. It's kind of like, you know, if you've ever, if you've ever had kids and like they do something really stupid and like I look at my wife and I'll be like, you know what your son did today, right? <laughs> you know that. You know what your daughter did today? <laughs> you kind of, you step away from your own ownership. God says to Moses, your people who you brought out of Egypt, even though in the very Ten Commandments, God says, remember me who brought you out of Egypt. God is now sort of changing their mind uh, to say, nope, it's, it's yours. You are owning this, Moses. And then, listen to this language coming from God. I mean, this is, we can sort of laugh at it, but also, wow. Leave me alone and let my wrath burn hot against them and consume them. This is a very angry God. And this is, a, we can sort of laugh at it, like I said, but this is also very serious, right? Let my wrath burn hot against them. And then God does a very curious thing, says to Moses, and then I will make you basically the patriarch of a great nation, which is strange because God already had promised Abraham to be the patriarch of a great nation. And check what Moses does here. How level-headed is Moses Moses asks God, why are you so angry? What is going on, God? Why are you so mad? And, God, and Moses reminds God, it was you who brought your people out of Egypt. These are your children. They're not mine. I'm working for you. These are your children. Remember that. And then he implores God, change your mind about obliterating them. You did that once, remember, with the flood? And then you promised you'd never do it again. He doesn't say that, but I think that's embedded in there. And also, then he says, remember Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who you promised their descendants would be like the stars, which I think could be a subtle reminder to God. Remember when you called Abraham to go out and look at the stars when he was questioning if this thing was working? Maybe you need to go look at the stars, God. Or... Maybe you need the breathing ball to settle yourself. Count to 10. Check your rage. And what's amazing about this story is that God does. Think about that. God changes God's mind. Moses implores with God to calm down and check yourself. This this brings me great comfort because I come from a hot-tempered breed and it gives me comfort that one, it's actually, Moses isn't saying don't be angry. He's just saying check the way you're going to live out your anger. So it gives me comfort because it's okay to be angry and it gives me comfort that even God needs the breathing ball every now and then like I do. Even God needs to take a deep breath and calm down. But that doesn't mean that God doesn't have a reason to be angry. And I think the message that we can take out of this today is, beloved, there's a lot in this world to be angry about. 
Like, I'm just going to go there, but I think it's probably safe in this space. Like, taking away reproductive rights from women, that makes me angry. That makes me really angry. Threats to pass legislation against LGBTQ communities that deny young people the ability to be who they are and to step into who they are. Yeah, that makes me angry, especially as a parent to a trans kid. It makes me real angry. And I'm grateful that my kid had the resources around him to get what he needed. This mess in the Middle East, and I don't even know who's at fault anymore, makes me angry. And our role in it makes me angry. And not just the fact that we fund some of it, but that the West essentially created the modern version of it makes me angry. There's a lot of reason to be angry, beloved. And it's okay to be angry. But, especially as we, again, move into this anxious presidential election season, let's be careful in our anger that we might not let it burn hot and consume not only others but ourselves. I heard one um, sort of a, a news person, I'll just say, um, say this, and I think, it's, I think it's right. I think this is really good advice. Take your anger and your anxiety around the condition of the world and calibrate it with, with action. Calibrate it with doing something about it, whatever it is you can do. So the message today is this. Yeah, it's okay to be angry. Even God gets angry. But also, maybe take the breathing ball once in a while to calm ourselves, to center ourselves in the steadfast love of God and move into that anger with healthy action. Let's pray. God, thank you for today, for your way, for your love, for your grace. And I even thank you for your anger. And may we together, O oh Lord, when we are angry, move through it in healthy, constructive ways. Help us to calibrate our anger and anxieties with action in this world that we may do our part in repairing it. Amen. And now we'll sing our responsive hymn.